At the heart of their rapid advance was a new military elite, the Waffen-SS, combat troops with a fierce devotion to the Third Reich. Our motto was duty, loyalty, the fatherland, and comradeship. The Waffen-SS were the ideological standard bearers for the Nazi leadership, and they were notorious for barbaric crimes. They got no kindness towards a man at all, or man or woman or child. They kill everything in the mist. At their wartime peak, they numbered nearly a million men, and in battle, they were utterly fearless. For them, death was almost inevitable. They expected to die, but they were also brutal when it came to killing. The Waffen-SS, literally the Weapon-SS, were Hitler's most loyal military force, rivaling the regular German army. In the 1930s, young Germans were desperate to enlist. As a Hitler youth leader, it was the done thing for me to join the Waffen-SS. All my predecessors were in the guard regiments or were officers there, and so I naturally wanted to join the guards as well. The Waffen-SS had grown out of Hitler's Schutzstaffel, his unit of personal bodyguards. It was a great honor to join. When I received the call-up order, I ran all over town. I was so happy to be called up. You see, only three or four men out of 80 were accepted at the medical examinations. The others just ended up in the German army, not in the Waffen-SS. In a time of high unemployment, the Waffen-SS offered an honorable career at the heart of the new Nazi state. Kurt Sammertreiter was one of many new recruits. And then I said to my father, listen, how about if I went into the SS? All I'd need to do is four years, like an apprenticeship, and then I can be a civil servant. Perhaps you already knew a little bit more about the whole thing, but I got my way. In four years, I'll come back as a civil servant. I'm going. But the soldiers of the Waffen-SS were servants of the Nazi regime. The head of the SS, Heinrich Himmler, wanted a unique new force, an army of ideologically committed elite troops to rival the regular army. As the Germans swept through France, the Waffen-SS was under the army's operational control. But many regular soldiers suspected the Nazis' long-term plans. Hitler and the generals assured the German army again and again that it was the one and only armed force of the state. Now, it became absolutely clear that another force was being built up alongside the German army that wanted to contend with the army for power. In France, one particular division gained immediate notoriety, the Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler, Hitler's personal bodyguard. Before the war, this unit had been dedicated to Hitler's personal protection, but now it was fighting on the front, giving the French a foretaste of what to expect from the Nazis. We did come across Hitler's personal bodyguard unit, the Leibstandarte, who would leave behind marks so that the reinforcements would know where they were. They had smashed up all the crucifixes throughout Catholic France. That was out and out heathenism, but at the time we didn't realize it. The Waffen SS was schooled to be the revolutionary shock troops of the Reich. By mid 1940, it was already 100,000 strong. SS leaders expected recruits like Gary and Goldman to be the crusaders of a barbaric new religion. Then some big shot came from Berlin, and we had to swear that we would not tell anyone what we were about to hear. They said it was a strictly secret official matter. And then the chap said to us that the victory would only be won when all the churches were ransacked. 
not just the Jews, but also the Christians. They all had to be got rid of first. Christ was an illegitimate son of a Jewish whore. That was the official view of Christ, you see. The army tried to stop this fanatical new force becoming too large and too well armed. It was hard to deny the military prowess of the SS units laying waste to Europe. But the regular army criticized them for being all show and lacking traditional military expertise. For their part, the Waffen SS despised the army as cautious and old fashioned. The commander of the Leibstandarte was Sepp Dietrich, a First World War veteran. Of course, we didn't think anything of his leadership qualities because he didn't have any experience. He had only been a sergeant in the First World War, you see. And even after that, he never enjoyed any higher military training. Dietrich's lack of training as a battlefield commander was apparent on the front line. His briefing was strange, to say the least. He just said, attack this, attack that, and you must all then come to some arrangement. It was like no briefing we were used to, with clear goals and clear boundaries, but rather, we'll do it like that then. You go to the right, and you go to the left, and I'll watch out, and so on. But the Waffen-SS soon showed that while some lacked training in battle, they had an unequaled capacity for cold-blooded killing. As the Luftwaffe bombed from the skies, German troops continued their unstoppable advance. In the face of this onslaught, British forces retreated towards the port of Dunkirk, embarking for the voyage back to Britain. The hundreds of thousands of retreating soldiers were given protective cover by a few French and British regiments. Among these troops was Albert Evans, then just 19 years old. Because the uh, people was getting off the beaches of Dunkirk, we were told that we'd, we'd got to hold our position at all costs, you know, so we held it as long as we could. On the 28th of May, Albert Evans and his fellow soldiers were surrounded by troops from the merciless Leibstandarte. Then the line just up at the end of a gable end and they got the machine gun on the road. They weren't very pleasant people to meet at all, none whatsoever. I mean, our officer pleaded with the one SS and he said, the point of where you going is a point of no return. We was put into a field, and uh, they put us into a barn, and that's when the when I started calling five out, and shot five first, then I called another five out, shot them, then chaps were getting a bit edgy, and the next thing I seen the jelly bending down, taking a a grenade out of his boot and slinging it in. Whether I caught the blast of that grenade, I don't know. But as I fell to the floor, the officer grabbed me, took this arm, and come on, Evans, he said, run for it. And we run out the barn, round. And of course, they got four of their men up the side of the barn, and they fired at us. The captain who saved my life and got killed in doing so. I must have stood up, and I got hit in this shoulder. It was only a stray bullet, but uh, I was all right. Uh, bleeding from my arm, bleeding from my shoulder, bleeding from my neck. I still struggled on and made me get away. Evans and Toombs managed to escape, but the Germans murdered 85 other soldiers at Wormhardt, the first Waffen-SS massacre in the West. Altogether, the Waffen-SS killed 185 captured British soldiers during the retreat to Dunkirk. What happened to us, I don't think, didn't come under the annuals of warfare. It was a cold bloody murder. I think so, myself. The killers went unpunished. The Waffen-SS encouraged ruthlessness as well as bravery. When they occupied Paris, the faithful soldiers of the Waffen-SS posed happily for Nazi newsreel cameras as war heroes. 
froh waren wir, dass, dass es vorbei war. We were happy that it was all over. Really happy. We were so happy that for a few days we, well, basically, we got drunk. Really, you see, we just wanted to forget. We just wanted to forget. Private archive shows victorious troops of the Waffen SS drinking themselves silly after battle. Many of these men had been farm workers or artisans, ordinary country folk. In the years to come, they formed the core of a vast army of battle-hardened fanatics, capable of great courage and sickening cruelty. In 1940, the Waffen-SS began recruiting troops from Nazi sympathizers throughout Europe. In newly occupied territories, Himmler was free to recruit as many men as he liked, without the German army setting limits. The vision of a pan-European army that would defeat communism inspired these foreign recruits. They also hoped that fighting under the Nazi flag would win them autonomy under German rule. When the Flemish leadership appealed for volunteers, they came forward in droves to fight against Bolshevism and to acquire an equal place for Flanders within the new Europe. By spring 1941, foreign volunteers had formed the first non-German SS division, the Viking. Later in the war in the Balkans, the Waffen-SS press-ganged all men considered to be of German stock. Many conscripts were shocked by the intensity of the training. We didn't have the faintest idea about the German drill, nor what the army and the military service were like in Germany. This drill, this briskness, this inflexibility, this inhumanity really hit us hard. In their barracks, young volunteers found they were getting much more than they'd bargained for. You see, in training we were really drilled with some very brutal methods. Not everyone was able to endure it. There were also some who wanted out. The only way of doing that was suicide. Recruits or volunteers, SS combat troops were trained to obey without question. Any slacking was mercilessly punished. If they didn't manage it, the whole group attracted attention and had to do extra training or something on Sundays. Then everyone went and gave the guy merry hell. He was dragged out of bed and beaten in the head and that kind of thing, so that he wouldn't give up next time, so that the troop would not be disrupted. There were some people there who just couldn't stand the pace, and so they did a bunk and hid in the basement. They were gone a long time, seven hours or so and they knew they'd be court-martialed or something, so they hanged themselves. That happened. The Waffen-SS were determined to disprove army accusations that they were amateurs. The Nazi combat elite was a new breed of military athlete, with a special training program designed by former army officer Felix Steiner. Recruits also had training in Nazi ideology. Naturally, we Obviously, we were trained militarily, but above all, we were taught the principles of National Socialism at the Officers' Cadet College. And we were actually proud of it. As elite troops, that was part of the soldier's craft. The SS Cadet College at Bad Tolz was a training camp for the officers of the new force. Training was based on the dictates of a Prussian general. From 1934, Paul Hauser dedicated himself to creating an SS officer corps to outclass that of the army. Later, as foreigners joined, cadets were taught to forget any racial divide in the new Nazi force. As far as we were concerned, every European who fought with us was equal, and so these differences didn't exist any